Hi, I'm Victoria Gao. I'm the director of the Bannister Art Gallery at Rhode Island College, and joining me today is Richard Witten. I'm Richard Witten. I'm a professor of painting here at Rhode Island College, and I've been um, full-time since 2006, although I've been here since 1991 in one capacity or another. And we're here today to talk about some of Richard's paintings for the Rhode Island College 2D faculty exhibition, which is on view in Bannister Gallery through September 24th. So first, let's just start with this painting. Uh, and tell me a little bit just first about the title. How did you come up with this title? Well, um, Les Nymphaeus means the lily pads in French. And um, I've always been impressed by Monet's lily pads, but I, um, decided to make my own version. If you see this, it, these circular shapes made me think of the lily pads and the frogs, which were not originally in the piece, led me to the title. Um, and I mean, obviously, Monet did not make frogs in his <laughs> lily pads, but I, I said I could. And so this is my version of Monet's lily pads. So, laid in face. And you're always inspired by older styles of painting, right? Because I know I've heard you talk about the Renaissance colors that you use in yes. your paintings and the sort of traditional, the richness of the oil. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what you changed then from these more historic styles of painting? Well, there are certain things that are quite contemporary. Um, one artist that I find um, conceptually interesting is Joseph Albers. And Joseph Albers has a, a famous series of paintings called The Homage to the Square, where he has a square that goes within to a square to a square that's smaller. And these, these shapes move forward and back. And the term was push-pull. Um, and, and so in my images, very often what will happen is that we have the outer edge and then we compress to a smaller space and a smaller space and a smaller space that's similar to, to Joseph Albers. And he's 1960s, 1970s. And to, that, to me, that is much more contemporary than the Renaissance. Yes. Um, in terms of the colors, though, I, I do try to work with Renaissance concepts. Um, they often try to get full saturation and, and, and they would use lights and darks and colors that were light and dark at full saturation so that um, their images would have more impact. That, that way their colors were not typically muddy. Um, much more, that's much more true in the, the Florentine paintings. Um, these, the colors in this are arbitrary considering that I'm not looking at anything. But there's something really important to think about. Red has a very important function in my paintings. Two things. It's often a frame, but our eyes are moved to red, so we often will spot red and move with it. That actually helps with the framing. But also, red is saturated at the midpoint, and so is green. Unlike blue, which is saturated dark, and yellow, which is saturated light. And so I find it to be a very flexible color. In other words, I can make, I can make reds do a lot of things. I can make reds be in a lot of places. If you notice, I can make red turn towards yellow and it can come forward, and then I can make it turn towards blue and make it drop back. Um, I can do similar things with green. Blues and yellows, because of their sort of extreme saturated value range, um, are, are much less, less flexible. Hmm. And I can see that you have a very um, precise way that you use colors, obviously by the, um, by the illusionistic aspect of your paintings. So can you talk a little bit about how you achieve that intense sense of um, realism? Like a lot of our visitors have come into this gallery space and immediately sort of been taken by, by this painting in particular and how they feel like they can just reach into the painting and sort of grab the balls that seem to be floating in midair. Okay. Um, it's an interesting thing. Um, a friend of mine who was a museum curator um, sent me an email and it was just this strange comment out of the middle of nowhere. He said, you know, I really love the fact that your work looks so dimensional, but also the fact that it's basically made up. 
it, I'm not working from a photograph. I'm not working from um, necessarily even observation. Um, and so what we're looking at here, I'm going to point out that I think the shadows are the thing that make something feel real. Um, so it, yes, I've modeled the ball. You can see that we have the light over here and then it works into the shadow here. But I think what makes it really feel real is, is this shadow. Mm -hmm. And I have, there's a lot of theories that I've developed about how colors will shift and, and become unsaturated and darker. So my colors here, if you notice, I've got the, these little green and blue and light green dots on this sort of olive mm -hmm. background, um, those all shift equally darker and equally also towards purple, mm -hmm. towards a violet. And, and then as I work into the lights, it's working into a yellow. And that is painting to painting. And this, this is particular to this, in this painting. Um, I've also looked at somebody like Michelangelo who developed a um, a way of dealing with color called conjuntismo. If you look at a Raphael, um, to use the English way to pronounce Raphael, uh, a Raphael, um, you're going to see that blue and red and yellow will shift light and dark together. And then you're going to get unsaturated in the dark and unsaturated in the highlights. What Michelangelo did was that he used yellow as a highlight, but he would use green or blue as a shadow, keeping saturated all the way through. So in this case, I'm actually putting what's considered a yellow here to make a light red. If you look at what happens here, this is really in name an orange, and this is in name a red. And oddly enough, if you work on Photoshop and you sort of pick these colors at the very dark moments, they register as a green. Huh. Um, because what you do, what I'm doing is I'm unsaturating the red with a green and, and actually the screen that pops up is, is green. Um, and so what's happening here is that I'm using different hues but in context, they still feel like these are all red or this is all white. And if you notice, my white has yellow in it and it has a transparent blue in it and it has a, um, actually it's a mixture of transparent green and transparent purple to make it darker here. Um, and so there's all sorts of colors in each object. I mean, so a white ball is not made with white very much. Uh, red, there's hardly anything that is actually anywhere near the tube paint of red. Um, that's a very Renaissance way of thinking of color. Um, other organizational factors, you know, red is creating this, this frame, the structure that moves you through, and, and then what's really important is value. What's light, what's dark, so that you can see the differences between objects. Um, there were certain very strong theories in, in both Venetian and Florentine um, uh, paintings about how color and value work together to make space, really quite differently. If you look at somebody like Botticelli, it's much more cartoon-like, and Titian, it's much more sort of lucid and limpid, light and dark. Um, I'm, I'm learning from both. Let's talk a little bit okay. about La Balcone. Um, Title-wise, Le Balcon is kind of self-explanatory. This is a, Le Balcon means the balcony. And so we have this, um, art, you know, uh, architectural structure that is kind of like a balcony. And, and then we have this well, um, but that actually has to do with way back when I, I was fascinated with Carl Jung and his, um, psycho psychological theories. And during grad school, I had the opportunity to be analyzed by a Jungian. Yeah. Um, and uh, we did dream analysis, and we found that I actually had, you know, it's not that surprising, this constant picture of a well as a, as a fount of ideas. Also fishing as a fount of ideas, that fish were ideas that I would catch. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so a lot of times I have something on a pulley, something mechanical that starts to talk about some level of motion, but here, very specifically, the idea of a well. Um, and I'm also playing with scale shift because if you notice, there's this gigantic ladybug. And uh, in here, I always thought that it was funny that a picture or a painting of architecture would typically be smaller than the architecture. And then I thought, well, why not put in something that was actually much bigger than the thing at the same time? Um, Shadow-wise, you see this, we are working with the same kind of idea of turning this yellow or golden color kind of purplish. Mm -hmm. And technically, this is, this is actually some kind of off-white underneath here. Um, it would be called brilliant yellow light for those of you who are thinking about that. But then there's a layer of um, transparent yellow ochre that's been put on and then wiped off. And similarly, to make this shadow, I took that brilliant yellow light, put a purple into it that deepened it, and then I put a, um, the, the transparent yellow light, or transparent yellow, with some purple in it too, and then wiped that off. So you see that the process needed to be the same on both to get that shadow to work. Um, I'm actually going to reuse this column. I rather like the way that that capital came out. Mm -hmm. And um, and I it, that's not quite purely imagined. It's um, because this shape comes from Venetian chimney tops. Oh, interesting. Renaissance again. And you talked about the architectural forms inside of me, of the columns, of the archway, but also of the of the panel itself. Mm -hmm. uh, can you? So, do, so I guess some people might consider your work sculptural or architectural mm -hmm. um, and not just purely two-dimensional. How do you consider the shape of the panels that you work on? Well, you know, the shape is important because um, when I... I had trouble with a rectangle. Actually, Don Judd did too. He said, you know, the problem with a rectangular painting is that it's a picture of things. And I, I too thought that. It's like, it felt like an illustration as opposed to the thing itself. And so I started, instead of Frank, what Frank Stella was doing, which is like building forward into these gigantic sculptural constructions, I said, well, let's shape the canvas. Let's see what happens, because if I look at this, and then I'm actually also mounting it so that it sticks away from the wall, we are forced as people to see this thing as an object right away which means that it's there, it has a size, it is a physical presence, and it acts like sculpture. But then you start to work inside it, and it has this imaginary space that works like a painting. So I wanted you, the viewer, to have a stronger sensation of being taken from the world here to this object, and then into this imaginary space. There's a favorite movie that I have, it's Orphe by Jean Cocteau, and in it the hero travels into Hades, it's sort of a, a remake of the Orpheus myth, and the way in that he discovers is to go through a mirror. And there's this beautiful scene where there's an angel that's leading him, him into it, and you look at it from the top, so you see him working into the mirror, but then you also see his hands going into the mirror and there's these ripples around it and then he passes through the mirror. And, and that, that experience is exactly what I want the viewer to have, the ability to say, here I am in this, this world, because I think the picture plate divides the universe into this, this, and the stuff behind. But you're here, you see this object, and then you slip in and you do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last question that I have for you today is what are you working on now? So this painting, as it says on the painting itself, was completed in 2000 and now we're, we're over 20 years past that point. Yeah, really. It's <laughs> kind of incredible, right? Yeah, it is. Um, so what have you been working on now? What can we look forward to? Well, we, from you? we actually begin something with this painting because there, I think this actually is the first painting that had something mechanical in it. And 
And one of the things that I kind of wanted to have in the paintings, because I had been dealing with just architecture, was I didn't have a sense of motion. And all of my paintings up to that time had been about how things could move in space. And, and I, I didn't, I, I'm not a narrative painter. I didn't want people in it. I didn't think it would be about something totally different if people were populating that, because then it become a story. Um, what I, so I said, what can move? Something that has the ability to move, something that perhaps needs to move, or that the, the viewer can sense moves. And so this has the ability to move down here. We have that weight that pulls this down. So there is a sensation of movement within the painting. Now I've been building um, both literally and imaginarily um, that I don't know quite word, what word to use there, but imaginatively, um, I've been building machines that could move generally powered by gravity because I can figure out how to translate this kind of energy into this kind of energy or this kind of energy. And, um, and so they are housed in, this, in larger architecture and it's still renaissance based but it's these machines that are oh i'd say 17th to 19th century in in terms of technology um mechanical not electrical don't know anything about electricity and um and so the space is opened up too this these both of these paintings are relatively shallow you know the space is opened up deeper behind um i've been playing a little bit with what happens in this area, which I always would call the marginalia, the way that illuminated manuscript paintings were had marginalia around the main image. Um, in fact, recently I started to put landscape within this, or painted landscape, so that it seemed painted, but then the inside part felt real, <laughs> and and it was two different ways to make a, a sense of depth. Um, also, the palette's gotten brighter. The palette has gotten significantly brighter within the last three years. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon. As I look at my older paintings, I feel like they're very dark. And I don't think it's that they've darkened. I think possibly my tastes are changing, but also possibly my eyes are. And, and, and so I'm going brighter and brighter with the whole palette, which incidentally is not as easy as you might think. Um, because oftentimes if you want to go brighter, you lose the saturation. Because as I was saying, I'm working on the fully saturated red. If I want that red to be brighter, how do I do it without making it go pink and, and, or gray? Um, and so that's been the, um, the later changes. I also have been making models of these objects or these, these um, machines. And that's been something new and actually a lot of fun. Um, to be very honest, I did it at first simply because I thought it would be fun. And I also needed better um, models for the shadows. Because I, you know, I don't have a shadow of this cast here, but now I will. Mm -hmm. So I will make the model, I'll put some cardboard behind it, shine a light on it, see what that shadow looks like. And, and I'm able to predict from that. Because all of this, this was all done strictly from imagination, strictly from um, theory, and all the shadows, like the little shadows here, they're all, they're all calculated. All of, all of these angles are calculated. Um, and I could do up to that point, but then, then you start to get something complicated, and, you had, and the shadows are just, it's just not worth calculating. Just build it and look at it. It's that much easier. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's been so fascinating to hear what a technical painter I think you are. Um, and, and these works are obviously really beautiful to look at. So you have until September 24th to see these works in person at the Bannister Gallery. You'll find information about how to pre-register to visit the gallery space on our website, which is www.ric.edu slash Bannister. Um, and then we'll see, you, we'll see you next time. Thank you for hosting me.